Hi, I'm Hal Varian. I'm the chief economist here at Google, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Barry Nailbuff. I have known Barry since 1980. When we met at Oxford, he was a student. I was an assistant professor visiting Oxford for the year, and we had many exciting intellectual conversations about economics, and, and we've remained friends ever since. Uh, so Barry is the Milton Steinbach professor at Yale School of Management. He teaches negotiation, innovation, strategy, and game theory. And he's written two fantastic books, one, Thinking Strategically, and the other, The Art of Strategy. Uh, both of them are great books. I had a little involvement in the first one, twisted his arm a little bit and said, this is great stuff, you should write a book. And by gosh, she went out and did it. Um, he's been a very successful entrepreneur as well, co-founding the Honest Tea Company. And he wrote a book about that experience as well called Mission in a Bottle. And that's one of the very, very few comic books, illustrated novels that's written by a professor at Yale, as far as I know. He's got a new book coming out soon called Split the Pie, and that's about the art and science of negotiation. And he's been kind enough to come visit us, at least virtually, and tell us about the book. So, Barry, I understand that in this book, there's an interaction with a troll, or so it was said. Sure. Well, first, let me just start with a, uh, a little bit more background in my introduction with Hal. Uh, we, uh, Hal was my first co-author. Uh, back in 1981, we wrote a paper together about risk sharing in non-classical environments that probably neither of us really remember. But it was a, a paper about what to do in risk sharing when there are economies of scale, something like a patent race where you only care about who comes in first. And I got a free trip to Sweden uh, as part of that. So I uh, thank you for my introduction. And not only was he my first co-author, in some ways he was my first teacher, because when I grew up as an economist, everybody used his textbook. It was the, uh, the way that we all started learning economics. And uh, yes, he was the one who introduced me to my publisher at W.W. Norton. I think he got a small stake of what ended up being a book, which has now sold 500,000 copies. So uh, that was a, a great win-win uh, that we had there. And also invited me to be part of Google, working on a potential partnership you had with um, the your friends at, uh, oh my God, are they even still uh, existing anymore? Uh, Split the Yahoo. 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 Yahoo, exactly. Uh, working as a way of bringing uh, Google's ad technology to Yahoo. Uh, and somehow the DOJ didn't really quite understand what was going on there. So thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. And let me explain what I'm talking about in terms of split the pie and then uh, bring that into the case of the uh, negotiation with an online troll. Uh, what's funny about negotiation is that the way economists see what's going on is completely different from the way that the rest of the world does. And as a result, people misunderstand what they're negotiating about. So here's a simple example to illustrate that. Alice and Bob are negotiating over a 12 slice pizza. They have to agree on how to divide it up. Otherwise they don't get it. But if they don't reach an agreement, Alice will get four slices and Bob will get two. The way the world sees that negotiation is that Alice is twice as strong as Bob. So Alice should get twice as much as Bob, therefore divide the pizza eight and four. Other people think, no, the fair outcome is you take the 12 slices, you divide them six and six. But the way I learned about things in economics from Hal is to think about incremental value that's created. And that if they don't reach an agreement, Alice and Bob will get four plus two slices or six in total. If they do reach an agreement, they'll get 12, so the purpose of the agreement, the purpose of the negotiation is to go from six to 12. Those incremental six slices are what the negotiation is about. Alice needs Bob every bit as much as Bob needs Alice. Therefore, they have equal power. Power and fairness say they should divide those six slices three and three. So what Alice gets is the four from no agreement plus three or seven. And what Bob gets is the two from no agreement plus three and five, right? That's how an economist would see it. And what's crazy is the rest of the world does not appreciate this. 
and therefore they get all confused about what the negotiations they make arguments about the 12 slices and not about how to divide the six okay so uh here's an example of how this happened uh this this pie approach uh was useful in a real life negotiation uh, i have this friend who's an idiot uh this friend decided to get a uh, file for a trademark on his own without hiring a lawyer to save some money. And what he didn't realize is that trademark applications are public when you make them. Because, of course, other people have to be able to respond to the trademark. They have to be able to object to it. You can't keep it hidden. Well, when it became public, this troll, who I'll call Edward because that's his name, went and bought the URL Dot com, the URL associated with the trademark. And my friend, you know, uh, goes to register, discovers it has just been taken that day uh, and writes uh, to Edward, who says, oh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to sell it to you for twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, and sometimes in negotiation, we call this an anchoring effect. Uh, he's out there trying to really soften up the other side. So uh, what should my friend do? Well. Uh, he's not, he's an idiot, but he's not stupid. And so he does a little Googling and discovers that there's an organization called ICANN, the uh, domain registry, uh, that resolves disputes. And what Edward has done is called registration in bad faith. And uh, essentially, if you go to ICANN, ICANN will restore the domain name to my friend. The cost of the ICANN dispute process is $1,300, and it's virtually guaranteed to be successful. In fact, if you do a little bit more Googling, you discover that Edward has lost every time he's gone up uh, to ICANN. Uh, he has a history of doing this. So my friend writes back and says, look, uh, you know, forget the $2,500. Uh, I'd rather go to ICANN uh, and pay them $1,300. You get zero. Uh, and so Edward writes back and says, uh, OK, $1,100. And now uh, it's time to discuss what the pie is. So my friend values the domain name at 10,000, at 20,000, really wants this domain name. So Hal, what do you think the pie is in this case here? Ah, <laughs> put me on the spot, huh? Yeah, well, you know, it's reverse the roles here a little bit. So what is the so, negotiation about? So, so, so the question is, if he gets the domain, what does he do with it? That is... Oh. He's going to he's starting a new company. In fact, well, I mean the other guy. The, I mean, if, oh, if, uh, if, Edward has zero use for this domain. Exactly. That that was yeah. my point. So yeah. zero use from his point of view. Correct. So you've got one where it's a huge value, huge thousands value. of dollars. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you've got the other that gets zero out of it. Yeah. So uh, well, I'm not sure I know. I haven't read your book, so I'm not sure I know the answer to the question. But I will say, I'd consider calling this bluff saying, yeah. no, too much. There's other domains. Yeah. I'll get that. So let's think about this for a moment. Whether my friend reaches a deal with Edward or doesn't, he's ending up with a domain name. Mm -hmm. He's either going to get it from ICANN or he's going to get it from Edward. So actually, the negotiation is not over who's going to get the domain name. It's only really over whether or not my friend's going to pay $1,300 to ICANN. And that what the two of them can do is save the $1,300. Right, right. So it doesn't actually matter how much the domain is worth because my friends got that. Mm -hmm. Can they say the ICANN $1,300? And who has more power in that, Edward or my friend? Well, if Edward says no, it's gone. If my friend says no to the deal, it's mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have, in my view, equal power. And what Edward has proposed is a split of 1100 200 by charging my friend 1100 Edward would end up 1100 ahead. My friend would end up 200 ahead. Okay. So one option is my friend could play the mirror game, the what we'll call fight fire with fire. Come back and say, look, hey, you offered me a $200 gain. I'll give you $200 for it. So there. But I think that just aggravates the other side. It escalates. You want to fight fire with water, not with fire. You want to put out the fire. So at this point, my friend explains what the negotiation is about and says, look, there's 1,300 to divide up. What you've proposed is you end up 1,100 ahead. I end up 200 ahead. I don't think so. Let's split it 650, 650. 
And Edward comes back and says, uh, look how far I've come down. I've come down from 2,500 to 1,100. I'll meet you halfway at 900. That's as far as I go. That's the lowest I'll go. Seal the deal. Let's make this happen. Well, first off, has Edward really come down that far? I don't think anything from 2,500 down to 1,300 should even count. Because until you're below the 1,300, there is no pie to discuss. And if you say how much he's come down, it's really from 1,100 to 900, which is 400. Whereas my friend has gone up from zero to 650. So my friend, basically, what does he do? Actually, he does nothing. He doesn't even write back. Because at this point, what does Edward stand to lose? Edward stands to lose 900. My friend, only 400. Edward is actually in a much riskier position, if you like, because he's trying to be too greedy. And a week later, Edward writes back and says, okay, let's uh, let's close this deal. 650. So what is, oh, oh, oh by the way, uh, you've probably guessed uh, that friend was me. Uh, and, <laughs> You're your best friend? Uh, my, my, my best friend. Uh, and of course, there's another moral here, which is buy the damn domain name before you uh, file for the trademark. That only costs you $1,250. Uh, but look, does Edward care about the pie or does Edward care about fairness? Absolutely not. He's a troll. Right. However, he understood that I did. And I have a principle. He has arbitrary. And principle beats arbitrary. Moreover, but, go but, ahead. But, but he does these dozens of times or hundreds yeah. of times. Yeah. You've already done it once. This is the first time you've asked for a domain name. That's true. So, so the question is, it's true that you have the motivation that, that you care about it. Yeah. He doesn't. But on the other hand, he's had experience and you haven't. But you're yeah. so smart that you don't need experience. You can figure out the logic yourself. When you have a principle, yeah, it helps. It, it, it beats arbitrary. And people have often said in negotiations, uh, you know, start with a high number to soften them up. I think this, which this is, it's called anchoring. But I think in the case of negotiation, you can get sunk by your own anchor, because if you anchor at an extreme point, you then have to make lots of big movements. Yeah. And the fact that he's moved from 2,500 to 1,100 to 900 tells me he has no principle. Whereas I don't have to move. I've given a logic to what's going on here. And if you'd like, I think this should appeal to the Googlers. You know, if you like, this is the not Dr. Spock, who's the pediatrician, but Mr. Spock uh, approach to negotiation. We're putting in some logic behind what's going on. And that once you figure out the pie, you can explain it to the other side. And they're likely to get what's going on. We are a registrar, by the way. You are a registrar, so I, I've, so, so I should have started with you right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a, it's a great point. Um, okay, but let me ask you to pursue that another point. I was on a committee many years ago about whether we should expand the number of top-level domains. Okay, sure. there were only the few domains that that like were dot com, there, dot biz, dot, and then something. there were country domains, and there were a couple of special cases. But we said no. I mean, or the people who were proposing proposing this said no, no, we should have dozens, if not hundreds, of more domains. Mm -hmm. So, what would that happen? What would happen to your argument if you had that capability of? An alternative name that isn't so bad. I mean, the yeah. one that's actually, not my favorite, but it's not so bad. Actually, one of the things I wrote to him is I said that the domain was makeroats.com. Uh huh. Uh, and then I sold the company to Pepsi. So I really did want that name. Uh, I sold it to Quaker, Quaker Maker, kind of was a, a good play there. Ah, okay. Uh, I did register maker oats.com uh, as a potential backup, but you know, I didn't want complication. I didn't want somebody else who could possibly get confusion. And so I don't know if it was worth $5,000 or $10,000 to solve that problem. But it was certainly worth more than $1,300. Yeah. And so I was prepared to go to ICANN in this particular case to get it back. That's not always going to be the case. Something else people say in negotiation is you should never reveal your bat. Now, you should never reveal your fallback. And here I did it. Did it put me in a weak position? So he knows that my alternative is paying 1300 but that doesn't mean I'm going to accept 1100 
he can't push me near that just for the same reason why I can't push him near his baton of zero. He shouldn't expect me to accept 1100 any more than I should accept expect him to accept 200 And therefore, once you understand the idea of the pie and splitting it, you're both going to make a lot of money relative to your BATNA. And you can now focus on how do you make the pie bigger rather than how you're splitting it up. Now, in this case, you could say it was a zero-sum game, so I can't make the pie bigger. But actually, not reaching an agreement is a way of screwing up the pie. Mm -hmm. And so by finding a way that worked for both of us, because I never want to ask somebody to do something that I'm not willing to do. And so therefore, if I'm saying I want to get more than half the pie, then I'm also asking them to say, to, if they then say, hey, I want to get more than half the pie, we can't actually both ask for the same thing here. And that's one of the definitions of things that are unreasonable. And if I remember correctly, in your other book, Coopetition, you talked a lot about making the pie bigger because their cooperation, even between competitors, could increase the size of the return to each of them. Exactly. And in fact, that was what led to the Google Yahoo deal at the time. Google is able to get more money uh, for each AdWord search than Yahoo was. Uh, you probably were the one who ran that test uh, to prove it. And so over time, Google will end up taking all those Yahoo customers away. Uh, who will discover the greater value of uh, the Google homepage. But there was a period where people were stuck there because of Yahoo Finance news email. And so if you could help them get more money per eyeball for the ads, then uh, you could share in that. And that was indeed the proposal. So uh, the goal is to think about how to expand the pie, but you can't do that if you have to watch your back the whole time about how it's going to be divided up. And so I like to start a negotiation with actually what the ground rules are. People often jump way too quickly into talking about price. And my view is, you know, you could say the funny way, which is, hey, do you think we should agree that each of us will act like jerks and take a zero-sum mindset and try and screw the other as best we can? And hopefully the other person will say, no, no, I, I'd rather not do that. In which case, say, okay, good. How about we've got this crazy idea called split the pie. And let me explain to you what it's about. And let's create this big pie and split it equally. So one case that shows up all the time in the tech world is standard setting. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we'd both be better off or would all be better off if there's a uniform standard for uh, technology in the home, things like sure. M, M, uh, and uh, just recently, just in the last uh, month or so, the top producers in that area have settled on a standardization uh, deal that allows everything to be interoperable. Great. So you can have one device from Google, one device from Amazon, they'll still talk to each other just fine. So this is a big step forward for the industry as a whole, I think. And it's a, it's a great example of what you're describing because there's a great deal of value there, but it took years of negotiation to get it in place. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things you're pointing out is, of course, negotiations get even trickier when I have more than two people. Yes. Because uh, if I have A, B, and C who are negotiating with each other, if they don't reach a deal, will it be A and B will do a deal? A and C, B and C, or they'll each go all separate ways. Right. And the pie is the extra value created from a deal compared to no deal. But I don't really necessarily know what the no deal is when I have lots of uh, parties, uh, whereas with only two, now I do know. It's what can I do on my own as opposed yeah. to what can I do with some other potential player? Yeah. And here, of course, the larger firms in the area are the bellwethers. They're the ones that people watch. If they're getting close, then the smaller parties will join in the deal because there's a lot potentially in it for them. Anyway, who's the intended audience for your book? Uh, all the people on this podcast uh, would be a, <laughs> a very good start. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the truth is all of us negotiate all the time. And so... Uh, it's something that we need to be able to do in a better way. And people are afraid of it because money is at stake. 
reputations are at stake. You can have bad feelings. Let's go. And so how do you do it in a way that is productive and allows you to take advantage of your strengths? My students at Yale are smart. They're empathetic until they start negotiating. And then they start acting like jerks because they didn't have any better way of doing it. And they're guessing that that's what you're supposed to do. And so how can we help you take advantage of your intellect, your logic, and apply that to bring the emotional level down and bring the logical level up? And understanding the negotiation pie, I think, is a way to do that. So you've taught negotiation to the policy majors, the business school majors, the mm -hmm. economists. What about the lawyers? Oh, I teach this uh, to some of the leading law firms uh, in New York, uh, the M&A lawyers. Uh, I teach this uh, at Yale Law School. So, yeah. uh, yes, it is uh, something that uh, I think has been uh, particularly uh, practical. Uh, a recent example one of my students told me is they had done a deal and uh, the company that was the target after all the terms were agreed to, said, you know, if we move the negotiation fees around in terms of legal fees, we can create a bigger tax loss. And the value of that tax loss uh, ends up being worth $30 million. And, uh, or actually, it's a $30 million tax loss after taxes. It's a $15 million tax savings, I guess. And so uh, it's our tax loss. So we should get that as part of the deal. Aha. Uh -huh. And this lawyer who had taken my classes on Should the Pie said, well, it's true that we need your tax loss, but you need our profits. Because only by putting your loss together with our profits do we, in fact, have the tax savings. Right. And so let's split it seven and a half, seven and a half. And he had no counter. Uh, and so you can try and be obstinate, but, you know, you look like a jerk when you do that. And it's, again, this idea that logic beats arbitrary. And it's kind of funny because people don't, people think one side is bringing more to the table than the other. Um, so one of the companies, how I mentioned I started is Honest Tea. And, you know, think about this negotiation with Coca-Cola. We were buying bottles at 11, uh, at 19 cents a bottle and Coke could get those exact same bottles for 11 cents. So they could save eight cents a bottle on a hundred million bottles. That's $8 million. Well, if we try and divide that $8 million up proportionally, proportional to sales, revenue, Coke's revenue, $40 billion, Honest T's revenue at the time, $20 million. That's 2,000 to 1. So Coke would get 7,996,000 and we'd get 4,000. Okay. That just shows you proportionality is insane. <laughs> Coke says, well, look. So I'm saying we should do it four and four. And Coke says, you know, I don't get it. It's our purchasing power. So you can't get those savings without us. What are you bringing to the table? And uh, the sarcastic answer is our inefficiencies. <laughs> the uh, truthful answer to this, which is true, uh, is also our customers. Without our customers who are willing to buy this delicious, lightly sweetened organic tea in an overpriced bottle, your purchasing power doesn't add up to anything. And so you've already applied your purchasing power on your products. If you want to apply them on ours, well, you need us. Just like actually Yahoo needed Google to apply the technology to increase the amount of money they could make on each ad. And so it's always the case that both sides are bringing the same thing, the same negotiation pie to any deal. Yeah, I think part of the problem with amateurs is this uh, mental accounting issue that I've got this much money in this category, this much here, this much here. And one of the points you're making is, well, it's not what you have when the bargaining stops, starts, it's what happens when you go home. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where that extra dollar came from, really. Yeah. That when you're measuring how much more is created compared to what we started with, well, the whole point of the negotiation is to beat where you started from. Yeah. yeah. And so therefore, don't double count the strength of the fallbacks. Because just because somebody has a better fallback, that means they're going to get more. Just like Alice had four slices rather than two in the pizza example, she's going to end up with two more slices. But that doesn't mean she gets any more of the six slices they're negotiating over.
Tell us another success story about how this applied in a, uh, especially if you had an involvement via the students or uh, your colleagues at Honesty. Well, uh, we the first time the theory of the pie moved from the academic classroom to real life was actually in my negotiations with Coca-Cola. And we had a problem. Uh, it made sense for Coke to buy the company. But at the time, our sales were 23 million, and Coke is excellent at bringing companies from 100 million to a billion in sales. They're also pretty good at taking a company from 50 million down to zero. And so we were too small to really fit into their system, which I'm sure is true for Google as well, in the sense of if the company is too small, you can get lost. And so they agreed that they would buy us in three years. And during those three years, they would help us with purchasing those 11 cent bottles. They would help us with distribution, with production. But now, Hal, I'm sure you can see what the problem is. The, the problem is, uh, what if they call something off during the middle? I mean, we no, get no, this situation. No, let, couldn't do that. Let's focus on the good news that they were all going to happen. Yeah. The problem from their perspective is they're going to help us increase our revenue, but they don't want to pay more for all the help they're providing. Ah, okay. Right. It means like, you know, what's their compensation? Uh, so uh, what are they going to get from it? In particular, they don't want to be penalized. You know, no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. So what we agreed in the first hour of the negotiation was, look, why are we doing this deal? It's to increase our revenue and it's to increase our revenue more than what we could do without your help. So we think we could get to X without you. To the extent we get above X, it's only because we were working together. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you should pay full price on sales up to X. And to the extent our sales exceed X, you should pay half price. So, mm -hmm. yes, you're going to pay more for your help because you need the vehicle in which to help. We're providing the vehicle on which your distribution, purchasing, production can make something better. And we can't do it without you. So we agreed in that first hour, let's create this big pie, let's split it. And then we had a fight over what X is, what can yeah. we do on our own? And we had a disagreement on what is the market value for sales of X? What is the right market multiple? But those were both data questions. And if you'd like, what we're doing here is turning negotiation into a data exploration exercise, as opposed to into a conflict. And I'm betting the people at Google are really good at those data exploration exercises. Yeah. So your point is you could look at other acquisitions that Coke made where the numbers kind of came out or you look at the- Well, you... not just Coke made, that all the, Coke had the data on all 27 okay. acquisitions that have been done in the beverage industry over the last decade. I see. So they they had that number as well and that would allow them to come up with a reasonable agreement and, about what the and data- And we didn't had. have that information. They had better information than we did. We knew about yeah. some of them. They knew about every one of them. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. So let's see. So can I, oh, I probably can't. I was going to say, can I ask you about your royalty negotiators with your publisher? But I think there might be some things that are no, off. No, so, no, that's uh, okay. All so right. It turns out I uh, messed up here, if you'd like. Um, my first, when after Hal introduced me to Drake McFeely, who is now, uh, what became the CEO and uh, president, uh, chairman of W. R. Norton. But in those days, he was just ha he was just a Drake, and he offered uh, Avinash uh, Dixit, my co-author, and I, the standard fifteen percent royalty. Fifteen, uh, yes, fifteen. And uh, you know, I said, "Well, Drake, what about thirty? Uh, and patiently, he explained to me, "Well, you know, there's." production costs, editing costs, marketing costs, there's risk that we take, there's my salary, there's the overhead. If we gave you 30% royalty, we wouldn't make any money. Uh, and I says, well, do you know what those numbers are? And it turns out he had a spreadsheet there. He had done the budget for this book. Yeah. And those numbers added up to about $75,000. So I said, well, Drake, you know, uh, if we were to cover those costs instead of uh, an advance, a retreat. Uh, if we were to pay you the 75000 could we have the 30% royalty? He thinks about it says, you know, yeah, actually. 
there goes my risk. I, you know, it's sort of that's sort of in some sense our profit. And essentially, we're really partners in that case. So sure. Uh, well, my co-author, uh, Professor Dixit, uh, he never sold uh, more than 1,200 copies of any book he had written. Uh, and wasn't That's so sure that people... Too. I know them well. Uh, he wasn't so sure that th this was uh, going to be a good idea. And so he didn't... Uh, he said, no, uh, I'll just stick with the standard. Now, uh, and I followed suit. Of course, what I could have done is just put in 37 and a half thousand and uh, bought the extra half, if you like, uh, from 15 to 22 and a half percent. Or I could have put in the whole 75 and got from 15 to 30. Uh, I did neither. The book sold 500,000 copies. That mistake cost me over a million dollars. Uh, however, uh, I haven't made that same mistake on this book. Uh, and... Uh, Michael Lewis, who you know from uh, everything, uh, uh, the fifth, uh, sorry, the uh, Premonitions is his new book, to uh, uh, Moneyball, to yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, he has 17 books, all with W.W. W. Norton. New, new thing. The new, new thing. And his About new Trump. thing uh, yeah. is to split uh, things 50 50 with W.W. W. Norton. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, and so, yes, actually, I think that's a better way of doing contracts with publishers. Uh, and uh, it may sound a little bit crazy, but the truth is, uh, what's the pie that's being created? I need the publisher to get the distribution, to get the editing, if you'd like. They need the content. Away we go. Yes, it's amazing. There's so many deals in the book business on placement. For example, I remember placement of the book in airports. Mm -hmm. You may have gone through that negotiation there, too. There's, there's something I remember called airports where you used to go and get on planes and things, but I, I don't know. <laughs> well, this is in the old days. But in any event, the point is basically you have no bargaining power there, at least in my experience, you don't. And it's all a question of getting volume and word well, of mouth out there. So actually, let's go back to Google okay. a little bit on this. I'm not yeah. sure of that because remember, you don't just take the ad where they're offering you the highest price. You're taking the ad which you think people are going to click on and they're oh, going to yeah. be happy about it. So the airport stores, sometimes I could pay for placement, but if there's no sales, that wasn't necessarily the right book for them no, to they, put they, it on the shelf. They would get sales, but the point is, the bookstores are a, in airports are typically part of a chain, and there's very little competition going on there, and there's a kind of an immediate interest in buying. Remember, they're a monopolist. Okay, I've got that. Yes. But here's the thing: if two people are offering them fifteen thousand for placement, and one yeah. of them's going to sell a lot more books. Yeah, yeah, of course, I agree. They, they care about that, just like Google cares not about the just about the price. They also care about the click through rate. Well, but the but the point is, in this case, I care about the uh, sales of the book because it's going to build the audience, build sure. word of mouth, build all this other stuff. There are all of these spillover effects, sure. and it's it's generally worth doing it. Although you don't do it, you 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 often wait a little bit. At least in my books, you uh, suggest they suggested waiting a little bit uh, and not coming out with the zero margin purchase right at the beginning. But I don't know if that's right or not. Again, my, it comes down to the numbers. My only point is there is some potential for negotiation. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't care just about the price. They also care about the sell-through rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty. Let's see. I think what we might do here, I'm just looking at my list of questions. Um, honest T... About yeah, it. so there's this there's this uh, issue of, of practical advice here. If you're negotiating a big deal, or mm -hmm. if I'm negotiating a big deal, should I hire a professional to do it for me? Now, you obviously you are the professional, so I'm not talking about that. But an ordinary person, not an economist, not an accountant, not a lawyer, what's the best thing for him, for him or her to do? Yeah, or they. Um, yes. So, uh, what I think they should do is uh work with professional if it's feasible yeah. even in my case actually i didn't want to negotiate the deal with coca-cola uh it was terrible because it was way too high stakes i cared too much 
and I want you to be objective here. Uh, and I can be much more objective when I'm negotiating for Hal than when I can for myself. The only reason why we didn't bring in investment bankers is Coke didn't want to turn this into an auction situation. And so they said, uh, no investment bankers or we're not talking to you. Ah. And, uh, okay, I had to take a choice. You know, am I willing to risk it uh, or not? Uh, and so uh, I was actually forced uh, to do it myself, which otherwise maybe I wouldn't have brought out the pie theory if I had had more professional advice uh, going on. So I am a huge fan of uh, putting an objective person uh, in there as part of the negotiation. So is it a, it's okay for me to say, but I want to be able to talk to my friend, Barry Nailbuff, before committing to a deal. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The audience, you've heard it there. So that's that's good. Okay, but uh, this distinction that you didn't want an investment banker. What? what, what no, what's I the, wanted it. They, I, didn't sorry, want it. they didn't want a, a, an investment banker. So, so of these various professions, we just ran through mm -hmm. the investment banker, the lawyer, the accountant, the financial yeah. advisor, etc. As a general statement, who would you go with? You'd go with. The, oh, I, I would with, go with a lawyer. With a lawyer. Yeah, and in particular, also. Uh, we had a lawyer who I think was a counselor in the true meaning of the word counsel. And don't wait to get to know your lawyer when you're starting to do a deal. It's he's like that guy in the, yeah, he's like that guy in the Godfather, right? The consigliere. Yeah. So Find you want somebody who, you under, who understands you, who understands what your objectives are. And let me say that, you know, these negotiations got very tense. At one point, Nestle had made us an offer. Uh, it got uh, bounced by the CEO of Nestle. Uh, they came back with a low offer. We said no. Uh, the person at Nestle wrote to Seth saying that Barry is destroying your family's future. Uh, uh, and, you know, you shouldn't be letting him negotiate. This is malpractice. Uh, so trying to split us up in various ways. So uh, these things can become very intense and very personal. Again, yep. uh, you want to have somebody uh often in between. On the other hand, if you can help people see things in terms of the pie, in some ways that pie can also be the intermediary for you all. Yeah. Uh, and so effectively, it's like this impersonal mediator who's providing this impartial approach. Let me switch to asking about uh, one of your other books, which I think is, is unique uh, in its category, and that is the uh, message in a bottle. Okay. Which, as I mentioned in my introduction, was a uh, book. Just man, my phone is making sounds here. We gotta stop that. That's what phones do. Yeah. Um, it, it, the case here is, it, as I explained to the audience earlier, it's a comic book, illustrated yeah. novel, as we as we call them. It's a great uh, book. Gra graphic nonfiction. Graphic nonfiction. Okay. It's a great book. Really, really interesting. I've recommended to uh, all of the entrepreneurs that I work with because it shows you all the things that can go, not all of them, but it shows you yeah. many things can go wrong. You can't count on things uh, being mm -hmm. uh, persistent. You just have to roll with the punches. At least that's the way I would interpret it. But what that's made true. you decide to write it as a comic book? Uh, well, you said the word unique. Yeah. And I'd say there are a lot of books out there which are how I built my business. Mm -hmm. And did the world need another one of those? Mm -hmm. Also, uh, in some ways, uh, let's have some fun writing it. Let's have some fun reading it. And one thing that's true about these graphic presentations is that every word counts. When you got a bubble and you can only put 19 words in there, you can't screw around with uh, being verbose. And so the material just goes super quickly. It was remarkably useful for me to learn how to do this because after working with the graphic artist, I then worked with an animator and the course created on Coursera uses lots of animation, which in some sense is the next step from uh, just a graphic presentation. And so as a method for teaching, as a method for learning how to write, 
Both of them were exceptionally useful. And I also think that the generation that we're selling this book to, they grew up on graphic presentations. So one of the things is you meet your audience where they are, not where you are. Sounds great. I think we're about ready to take a few questions from the audience here. Let's do it. Uh, uh, okay, here we go. I have to read the question. Is the split the pie approach applicable to all negotiation contexts, or is it best suited for certain scenarios? Great question. Yeah. Uh, it is easiest to apply in negotiations with two parties. Because there's where you can calculate the pie without too much difficulty. I think as you're starting to get more and more parties, uh, we do have a chapter which talks about multi-party negotiations, but I'll say it is more advanced and it's more complicated. So I would start out with thinking about it for two-party negotiations. And it isn't just issues of mergers or buying domain names or dividing pizzas. It's any time you're having a negotiation, start with what's the pie? Why are you doing this? What's the purpose of the two you gain together? And the good news is that focuses on the positive. Instead of telling the other person why they're useless, you focus on why together we're going to create something great. What about negotiations where there's dollars are not involved? I want to go out to this restaurant. You want to go out to that restaurant. We both want to eat together. Yep. like the battle of the sexes in uh, sure. game theory. So does that impact anything in terms of the pie negotiation? So one of the lessons that we say in the book is to give the other side what they want. And I say that not because I'm generous, not because I'm nice, but because if they get what they want, then I can get what I want. So what does that mean? Figure out who wants the restaurant more than the other and let that person get it and then compensate you in some other way, whether it means they're doing the dishes, taking the dog out for the last walk late at night, whatever it is. Uh, we're not here necessarily negotiating about money. So think about it this way. If Hal and I are splitting three servings of beets and three servings of broccoli, it doesn't make any sense for each of us to get one and a half scoops of each because I don't like beets. <laughs> and I'm assuming Hal does. And so Hal should get all the beets and I should get sure. all the broccoli. All right. So it gives you an extra dimension to the negotiation that you didn't have with the straight so, money. So create this other dimension that if yeah. somebody cares more about some decision, don't fight over it. Right. Give it to them. Yeah. And the corollary, of course, is somebody really doesn't want to give something up. Don't make them yeah. because effectively then you're taking away from them something they really want, which means they're not going to give you what it is you want. Yeah. It also means you have to answer as well as ask questions. So people think you have to answer questions because of reciprocity. The other yeah. side will stop answering your questions if you don't answer theirs. There's another reason to answer questions, which is you want the other side to give you what it is you want. And they won't know that unless you help them by answering questions. So so what about the threat point? Let's go back to the Coke negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the threat point is you don't reach a deal, yeah. but then you're going to trot over to Pepsi, right? Or some sure. other soft trick. Yeah. So, it's, so it's not just the uh, that you get uh, zero out of. You learned a lot in this negotiation, and you can apply that knowledge in uh, dealing with competitors. Absolutely. And I think here's another case we have to be really careful about how you go about this. So one other company that we negotiated with, uh, a, uh, a tea bag company, uh, basically gave us an offer that we weren't particularly keen about. And then said, well, if you don't take this offer, we're going to crush you like these tea leaves in my hand. Uh and one, we weren't really convinced that was true because just because you're good in tea leaves, tea bags, doesn't mean you're good in bottled tea. But also, do we really want to sell our baby to such a jerk? But that's not the kind of person who we want to be working with in the future, who we want to entrust our company to. Right. This is the first decision among many if we get together. 
Yeah, in fact, it's all. And by it's a lesson for you who are negotiating salaries, negotiating yeah. with your boss. Yeah. Basically, they often really learn about you for the first time through the negotiation. So don't be a jerk. Now, what did Coca Cola say in comparison? They said we looked at 500 companies. We did a deep dive into 30. We've met with five. You are our number one choice. You're the company you want to buy. However, it's important for you to realize that we've been given a mandate from the board to buy a tea company. This happened right after the Coke and Nestle, the Nest Tea Partnership, broke up. So for the first time in 25 years, Coke was able to buy a tea company on their own. And so therefore, you should understand that whatever happens, we are going to get a tea company. We want it to be yours. Now, implicit in that is a threat, right? Which is, yeah. if you don't sell to us, we'll buy these other people and compete with you. But they're not saying it that way. They're saying it in the nicest possible way. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to help the other side appreciate their batna, but you don't want to do it in a way that comes across as a threat. Yep. Let's take another question. <clears throat> Ignacio, does your friend care about the cost to society of feeding the troll? Uh, my, so remember, my friend was me. Uh, yep. Yes, I do. Uh, I feel bad about that. Uh, but, you know, it's one of the reasons also why I sure as heck wasn't going to go and let him get more than half the pot. Uh, so the idea of letting the troll get more than half the 1300 Absolutely not. No. And look, if we go back in time uh, to the Cuban Missile Crisis, do I really want to negotiate with the Russians? Well, you know, it's saving the world. And yeah, okay, we got rid of the nuclear missiles in Turkey. Uh, and uh, that's better than having nuclear war. Uh, do I want to negotiate with Putin over Ukraine's membership in, uh, in NATO? No, but do I want war there? No. And one of the things we appreciate is that some people can destroy Pi. And their ability to preventing them from destroying Pi is actually a way of creating Pi. So uh, at some point, you have to think about your reputation effects, because, of course, I want to have a reputation of not negotiating with dictators, with terrorists, because that opens up people in the future. But it has to be done. I mean, you can't walk away from that negotiation. There's got to be the attempt, the attempt made. Absolutely. And the question is, can you keep it private? Uh, yeah. Is that a possibility or not? Yeah. How about another question out there? Okay. What should be your friend's strategy if the friend did not have heard of ICANN and your friend is short on time? Okay, yeah. so this is a person who wants a domain name. They don't know what ICANN is, but they really need to get it by the end of the week. Yeah. So just again, that friend, remember, is me. That's you. That's you. That's right. I remember. Uh, just, just uh, my. We haven't really got that idea across somehow. Or these are. Well, uh, they may have answered. Yeah. They may have answered these questions before. Early on. Uh, so, uh, a couple things. Uh, one is, uh, what's an alternative name? So instead of makeroats dot com, maker dash oats yeah. dot com. Uh, realizing uh, that actually most people don't even type in URLs anyway. They're going to Google the name Maker Oats, and if Maker Dash Oats is the one where all the traffic is going, that's what's going to show up in terms of the Google site. Uh, and, you know, in terms of being short on time, the truth is that the other side has no idea whether or not I'm in a hurry, I'm not in a hurry. Uh, one thing that's advantageous is that if you Google the name of the business, there's no evidence that it's actually running. So the person doesn't know, am I just thinking about this now? Uh, what is going to be the future of this company? So I think the other person is every bit as sort of concerned about time uh, that I am because basically the person's going to figure, if I don't do this deal with him, I'm going to come up with some other name for the company, some other hyphen thing, some makeroats.us.biz. Uh, and it'll be good enough. So uh, that would be my strategy in this particular case. So I have read or I've heard that in the Nixon-Kissinger deals with the Chinese way back 
whatever that was, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, uh, Nixon instructing Kissinger to tell the Chinese he was crazy. Nixon wasn't rational. He didn't do any of these calculations. He didn't know anything about pies. Look, <laughs> you don't know what the crazy thing is going to do. So yeah. what is that strategy? Uh, how does that strategy of, of uh, signaling to the other party that you couldn't be crazy? There's a great story about this more recently, and I'm blanking on his name, but the Greek minister of finance oh, yes. during the whole currency crisis talked about the rational advantage of acting irrational to get the yes. other people to give into your demands. The problem is that you've got to be a really idiot if you talk about it doing it that way. <laughs> because it's like, okay, I just read that piece where it says you rationally are planning to act irrationally. Uh, so, so much for that, Mr. Hyper-rational. Right. Uh, and part of the problem is, is since rational people do have an incentive to pretend to be irrational, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be buying it when I see that happen. Moreover, I'm also going to say to the other party, you know, help me understand your reasoning here. And just saying, I want the 900 because I want the 900 isn't a great reason. Yeah. So, so it might be a reasonable strategy for politicians, but not for economists, I guess. Yeah. Or it's, <laughs> you know, if two people are playing that game, that's an easy way to get no deal. Yeah. So again, you want to put fire out with water, but also it's not, uh, it seems appropriate to say to somebody, look, you may be irrational, but you know what? This is my position. And so tell me where I'm wrong. And I, if you can explain to me where I'm wrong, I'm prepared to change. Mm -hmm. But you're just saying things that are arbitrary. Now, if I know that's who I'm negotiating with from the start, okay, you know, I can play that game too, but it's unlikely to be very productive. Okay, we got a couple more questions coming in here. Uh, next question. Okay. Are there particular situations you believe BATNA should not be revealed? Yeah. Is there a framework on how to disclose information and when? So you, thank, oh, here's a former student, by the way. This yeah, so thank you, student. Google, for hiring Logan. Thank you, Logan, okay. for uh, coming in here. Um, you know, there are, I think in general, people don't talk enough about what their real interests are. Uh, so in one example of a case that I taught uh, with Logan, a person selling a gas station, and their reason was to take a trip around the world. Should they reveal that or not? Well, uh, the buyer knows that they're selling it for some reason. There's good reasons and there are bad reasons. A good reason, a bad reason is there's a leak in the underground storage tank and it's going to have a super fun site. A, a good reason is, hey, I want to travel around the world. That's not bad news. And people keep things that are hidden. I keep things that are hidden that should be revealed because once I understand what your objective is, I want to put you on that boat because if you go on the boat, I get to buy the station. And then I learn that you don't have a job when you come back. And I think you're a great manager. So what I want to do is give you a job when you return. That means you really want to sell the station to me. Okay. Now, does that mean that I need to tell you I have a boat payment coming due in, oh, uh, 35 minutes. And if it doesn't happen, you know, I'm going to lose everything. Well, by the way, if I really need the money in 35 minutes, yeah, actually, I probably <laughs> should. Um, yeah. If we've agreed to split the pie, yeah. then I think we're in a much safer position in terms of revealing our BATNA. If, in fact, I think the other person is going to try and push me to my BATNA because they're the jerk, the irrational type, the zero-sum mindset type, then I think I have to keep those things hidden. So can we get the framework established up front? And can we also behaving in a way which has some reciprocity? And you can also reveal things in the start, like my BATNA begins with a four, uh -huh. as opposed to it's $436,912. Yeah, so partially, you can partially reveal, yeah. Next question. What do we got here from Sophia? Oh, it's not a question. It's an exclamation point. Thanks for coming today, Barry. What advice do you have for those who struggle to make negotiations? Yeah. 
Uh, one is to practice. And to practice uh, one place you look. Okay. What's the clear advice? I mean, that's, that, that we, don't, we don't have to get around here. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> Buy the book, right? I mean, you know, what, what, can, I, what can I say? Um, so um, I'm guessing that Sophia is the kind of person who doesn't want to be taken advantage of, but doesn't want to act like a jerk. Yeah. And so, yeah, you're <clears throat> uncomfortable because people are going to make you uncomfortable in negotiations. And that's why you need to have this alternative. Uh, so there are case studies in the book. The Coursera course also gives you chances to practice with other people, ah, uh, other people taking the class and see what happens. And then you can watch debriefs of how your negotiation went compared to other people's. And so it's a little bit like uh, those alternative paths of the universe in terms of their forking. And you can see if you'd made a threat, if you had made an ultimatum, uh, how that could have been diffused, what happens if you lie, and so on. Yeah. My friend, who was a lawyer who taught negotiations in the law school, uh, was very keen on running these in-class experiments. I think they're a great idea because partly people can get over the fear or the anxiety or whatever emotional feeling they have and treat it as an, a, a, a rational uh, negotiation. They could also discover that acting like a jerk doesn't help yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, one, because they're actually generally not very good at being a jerk. Uh, and two, they can just see how, excuse me, how things blow up. And so then it can get more comfortable with becoming their true self in negotiation. Okay. Now I have a message here. More questions came in, but I, that may be delayed, uh, from a few minutes ago. So I think we said we'd go until one thirty. Is that right? Everybody, I think we should negotiate that. that. Yeah. Two more minutes. All right. That's there's a message came in. Two more minutes. So it's your last two minutes. Do you want to sum things up? When sure. when will you be able to buy your book? I mean, all these things. Yesterday was the book's birthday. Ah. So it, it came out. Uh and uh you can go to split the pie book.com. Uh I haven't negotiated with the troll who owns split the pie.com yet, but that's uh something to happen uh in the future. Uh and there you can see some videos, a little excerpt of chapter one. Uh, my, uh, I guess, big takeaways are don't just ask, ask with a reason. The way to figure out the reason is to start with what is the pie, to understand what's being created in terms of the negotiation. If you can agree with people to figure out to, to split the pie, then you can turn your attention on making the pie bigger. And you made the pie bigger already because you're going to have a deal. So yeah. that's worth a lot just to begin with. Yeah. But you can make it a better deal. Having said that, understand that this is not the way the world negotiates. I'm not describing common practice here. We're trying to change the world. So in order to do that, you're going to have to be able to convince others. Mm -hmm. That starts with convincing yourself. So this is a good way to start doing that. And unlike most of the other books on negotiation, this is a book that works well when the other side has read it too. Uh -huh. And so it's not like, oh, I've got some little secret here about yep. uh, I'm going to anchor high. Well, I'm going to anchor high. Oh, and now it's actually worse for both of us. So when both people understand what they're really negotiating about, the whole negotiation should go much smoother. Raise the anchor, but not too far. There we go. All right. Thank you so much, Barry. It's been great hearing you, great seeing you. Best of luck with the book. I'm going to run right out and get one. Just one? Just one? <laughs> For starters. There we go. Hal, it's such a pleasure to be here back with you again. Yeah. And uh, let's not wait another however long it is uh, to be continued. Let's make some big pies together and split them. Thanks, everybody, right. for joining us. Sounds good. Sounds great. Thank you.